What does it mean to be an astronaut, staring into the night sky in wonder, looking for adventure, life, and intelligence in the dangerous and unexplored vacuum of space? An astronaut must be brave, prepared, and most importantly, imaginative. When searching for the unknown, they'll never know what they'll encounter. Yu-Gi-Oh! has had some amazing and historically great deck builders like Jeff Jones, Lazaro Bolito, and Jesse Cotton, who have all pioneered time and time again to transcend entire formats. But the game has also had some far less recognizable brilliant minds who have discovered and reached greatness with their bold decisions. This story is about the latter, a duelist who went completely against the grain in an attempt to carve out his own path and the shocking success he was able to achieve as the community watched in complete disbelief. Before I dive in, I'll apologize in advance for the lack of pictures of our leading star as well as some of his duels. Throughout two premiere events, he only received a couple of feature matches, and in one of those duels, they decided for some reason not to snap any pictures of him and his opponent, so there's barely anything to work with in that regard. By the way, if you like videos like this and enjoy learning about Yu-Gi-Oh!'s history, help the channel grow by giving the video a thumbs up, commenting your thoughts below, or by sharing it on social media. This story and its events took place in the middle of 5Ds immediately following the dreaded and blood-soaked days of Synchro Cat and Dark Strike Fighter. The September 2009 ban list killed off juggernauts like Crush Guard Virus, Monster Reborn, and Dark Strike Fighter, as well as limited about another dozen powerhouse cards in an attempt to calm down the aggression a bit. The result was a format where players largely had two options, either accept this new slower pace and build accordingly, or turn to wild and unpredictable methods to satiate their desire for chaos. An example of the former would be the death of Synchro Cat and the birth of its spiritual successor in the X Saber deck, pioneered in large part by one Roy St. Clair. An example of the latter would be a duelist choosing Lightsworn or one of its many variants where you didn't know exactly how any of your turns would play out because of their volatile milling mechanic. You could probably say that there was a clear line of demarcation between the control decks like Black Wings and Gladiator Beasts and the more mayhem-inspired ones like Lightsworn, its variants, and some of the zombie-based builds. The final Shonen Jump Championship of any format is usually a bit of a toss-up. On one hand, duelists are often hesitant to truly innovate and try new things. They usually fear if successful, their strategy will be leaked going into the new format, and many will either copy or adapt to it. On the other hand, the end of the format can also be a perfect time to break out something new and never seen before, while 95% of the players are using and prepared for the status quo. This is how Kenny So from the legendary team comic Odyssey won Shonen Jump Indianapolis with CO Burn in August 2007, just two weeks before that format ended. Allow me to introduce the best dressed duelist in the history of the Shonen Jump Championship circuit, Alex Mitchell, hailing from Nashville, Tennessee. We'll get into his unique style later. At Shonen Jump Nashville, held in late February 2010, Alex entered the event with the same mentality Kenny So did three years earlier. Strike first, strike hard, beat him down with something they've never seen before, and maybe knock him out before they even knew what hit him. Alex held the core belief that no duelist needed to follow the meta to be successful and win, even at the highest levels of competition. He was also wildly imaginative, some might even say naive, as he thought that keeping his deck incredibly simple would be a huge benefit to him. Lastly, Alex was very big on playing aggressively and believed that it would often throw people off, especially when combined with his seldomly seen deck idea. On the weekend of February 27th through the 28th, Alex attempted to put all his ideals on full display as he entered the event held right in his backyard with a radical spaceship deck he and his friends named Holy Ship. Coincidentally, that's also what a lot of his opponents said, as almost none of them had any idea what half of his monsters actually did. Sure, people were familiar with the meta mainstays like Sangan, Honest, and Gore's Emissary of Darkness, but the Gradius cards have always been incredibly obscure. The idea that someone would not only play them, but also build their core strategy around them and then have the gall to enter a Shonen Jump Championship using the deck is almost beyond belief. As obscure and underground as Alex's deck was, his main strategy wasn't very complicated. Again, he pretty much prided himself on keeping this deck simple. He even said online that the deck wasn't built around any specific go-to combos or fancy opening plays at all. Fill the deck with a bunch of solid light machine monsters with the idea that when they destroy an opponent's monster by battle, they themselves can produce more offense by the way of summoning tokens who can also attack. Cards like Blue Thunder, T45, Victory Viper 3, and easily my personal favorite because of its outrageous name, 
Lord British. Lord British Space Fighter all have effects that can pump out more damage for free or utility spot removal ones. These three were all tied together by Jade Knight, which can search all of them if destroyed by battle, and offered two of the three protection from powerful blowout traps like Mirror Force and Torrential Tribute. This protection was often an overlooked element of Jade Knight, however it synergized perfectly with Alex's playstyle as he always wanted to be the aggressor and some of his opponents would burn cards completely in vain. Of course, Honest was one of the biggest drivers of this deck as every spaceship was light attribute and some of Alex's non-spaceship monsters like Shining Angel benefited from it as well. Many don't know this, but even Gores, a dark monster, was technically aided a ton by Honest back then as the token it produces is ironically light attribute. Honest being unlimited during this format was a huge catalyst to Alex's success. However, he also packed this deck with other ways to help his micro machines easily run over opposing threats. A pair of enemy controllers in Book of Moon would stop enemy attacks as well as put threatening monsters in their most vulnerable position. He also teched in copies of Creature Swap, which was always known to lead to spicy plays back in those days. Swapping a Jade Knight, Token, or Shining Angel meant that Alex would get a bigger monster, battle damage, possibly a triggered effect via killing his own card, and maybe a token for even more damage. Lastly, Alex had his trump card, Limits or Removal. This card was used for closing out the game when he had multiple monsters or tokens on field and was especially potent when combined with Honest. One of the interesting things about Alex's spaceship deck was how well it danced around one of the most popular traps in the entire metagame at the time, Bottomless Trap Hole. In fact, only a single monster in his entire main deck could even be affected by the card, that being Blue Thunder. Keep in mind, Gores summons itself during the damage step, when of course Bottomless can't be activated. Speaking of the damage step, it kinda goes without saying that with Triple Honest, this deck could easily keep up with the Blackwing Kaludes or Lightsworn shenanigans of the time. In addition, Alex built this deck in a way that made it completely immune to arguably the most powerful trap of that entire format, Royal Oppression. You might think that I made a mistake by not including Alex's extra deck, or maybe I couldn't find it, but neither is true. The reason there's no extra deck cards in this list is because he didn't play one, like at all. In fact, outside of Call of the Haunted, the only time that this deck can even attempt a special summon with cards like Gores, Shining Angel, or any of the token producing cards is in the damage step. That meant opposing Royal Oppressions were completely useless against Alex, but he'd still get full value out of the card. The one major drawback to aggressive builds like this spaceship deck is that they usually relied on a lot of neg one high utility cards see Enemy Controller, Book of Moon, and Dark Bribe. This could lead you to sometimes having a light point lead, but down in card advantage, which is not a position you want to be in most of the time. However, Alex wisely opted to include the unpredictable and largely forgotten about Morphing Jar to refill his hand completely. This was a strategy straight out of the Justin Womack playbook I covered in a previous video titled The Razor's Edge. At Shonen Jump Nashville, Alex was on fire and dominated most of his opponents. It wasn't just that the deck was fundamentally solid, but people just weren't prepared to face so many cards that they had either never seen before, or ones that at best were historically super niche, like Nobleman of Extermination and the original Trap Hole. Alex finished Day 1 Swiss with an impressive 8-2 record, placing him 10th overall. Unfortunately, he would be going into the top 16, facing arguably his worst possible matchup. By worst possible matchup, I don't mean a specific deck either. I mean a specific player. Alex was scheduled to face former Yugi tuber Audric High, aka High Audric. Look, I'm old, so I remember this guy. Audric was playing a fast and furious zombie lightsworn deck, and coincidentally, the two had squared off in round three during the day one Swiss. Alex absolutely destroyed Audric in that game as he won 2 0. However, in winning this battle, he honestly lost the war. Now going into top 16, Audric knew all about Alex's wild spaceship deck. The element of surprise was completely gone, and the results bared as much when Audric completely flipped the script and won in a 2-0 dominating fashion. After the event, Alex's spaceship deck was one of the biggest talking points on Pojo forums, with people making multiple threads discussing it. When Alex himself made his first real thread in the forums, he was treated almost like a celebrity as he was bombarded with questions about his deck, and former Konami employee PJ Turney even asked Alex for an interview for his blog which unfortunately is no longer up. Alex's thread was viewed over 14,000 times and garnered almost 400 posts as he made his debut as Mr. Suit. 
On that note, Alex said that he wore a suit and tie to the event simply because he wanted to stand out and be original. See his deck choice. With the September 2009 format in Shonen Jump Nashville officially over, most expected Alex to be a complete one-hit wonder. After all, there's no way that a fluky deck like his could possibly top twice, right? Wrong. Even with Honest going to semi-limited status on the March 2010 ban list, Alex's spaceship deck was still fully viable in the new format, and once again, he put that on display at the 2010 United States Championship held in August. He did make some alterations to the deck list, like dropping Gores, Call of the Haunted, as well as the mandated by the ban list copy of Honest. This made room for a full playset of the anti-meta titan, Thunder King Ryo. Ryo at the time was simply amazing against X-Sabers, Blackwing, Infernity, and all the searching of gadgets. It was pretty much spectacular across the board and really didn't have any bad matchups. Alex named this new 2.0 deck Thunderships and went to work. He started out the day on a hot streak with a 4-0 record which earned him a feature match versus a frog monarch duelist by the name of Jerry Hemphill. Alex won the duel over Hemphill in a 2-0 fashion as commentator and world's participant Mike Cunningham pointed out his amazing use of enemy controller. In this pivotal play, Alex's back was really against the wall and he was facing down a Gores and a 4 negate light and darkness dragon with enemy controller set, 1900 light points, Sangan and Lord British in hand. Alex drew Book of Moon and set it alongside his Sangan. When Hemphill went in for the kill, Alex activated Econ by tributing Sangan, attempting to steal Gores. Lad tried to negate, but Alex chained Book of Moon to put it face down, thus causing it not to resolve. After searching Honest with Sangan, Alex still needed a good draw to win, and that's exactly what he got. He normal summoned Lord British, proceeded to the battle phase attacking Gores, then dropped not one, but both of his copies of Honest during the damage step. This skyrocketed, pun intended, Lord British to 6600 attack, and he ripped through Gores like paper mache. Alex then activated its effect to attack again in a row. That attack was used on Light and Darkness Dragon. When Hemfield were born to monster using Lad's effect, it didn't matter. Those were the days when hard once per turn effects didn't exist yet, so as long as Lord British kept running over monsters, it could technically attack infinitely. 16600 attacked to the face later, and it was all over. As an unrelated side note, I would like to point out, I find it completely baffling that head writer Jason Gerbermeyer specifically pointed out how Alex Mitchell was always known for being well-dressed and still opted not to take any photos of his feature match. Moving on. Alex continued his run and ended the Swiss rounds with a commendable 8-3 record, which was good enough for 40th place and qualified him for the top 62 day 2 single elimination portion of the tournament. Unfortunately, he did lose his next match and his Nationals run ended right then and there. This would be the last that we ever saw of Alex Mitchell in day 2 events, but many rogue duelists and budget players alike saw him as a hero for these performances as he topped multiple premier events with a simple and incredibly obscure deck that cost about $50, minus the Ryos. Truly a testament to not needing to play meta to win in Yu-Gi-Oh! And with that, we are at the conclusion of our story. If you enjoyed this video, or more importantly, you learned something, give the video a thumbs up and subscribe for more videos just like this one. You think you can beat me with that loser? Crush its head! <laughs>